Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Terry McVenus, the president and CEO of RTCA. Greetings from our nation's capital. Happy St. Patrick's Day and welcome to all of you for what is now our ninth in a series of webinars, Aviation Technology Connect. We're pleased to have created this series via this platform to hear from a variety of aviation leaders on a broad spectrum of topics that will educate you, further inspire you in your profession, and perhaps even evolve your thinking as to where the industry is today and, and where it might be going in the future. This series of webinars has, has been very successful, exceeding all of our expectations here at RTCA. We've attracted an international audience of upwards of 400 people tuning, tuning in each month, not only from here in the United States, but also from Canada, countries across Europe, the Middle East, Africa, South America, Australia, and New Zealand. We've heard from leaders at the FAA, the NTSB, and others from our aviation industry. And we believe that today's webinar is gonna be equally exciting and informative. These previous webinars were all recorded, as is this one. So if you want to go back and listen to any of our previous webinars, you can find those recordings on the RTCA YouTube channel. We have been holding these webinars on the third Wednesday of each month, and like today, each one focuses on a particular topic where you can gain some insights from industry leaders that I'm confident will be inspirational, strategic, or even thought-provoking, with the primary goal of, of them giving you, uh, the audience, the gift of their knowledge. I know many of you watching today are familiar with RTCA, but I, I do know that we have some first-time visitors with us. So I want to take just a couple of minutes to familiarize you with who we are at RTCA. We're an aviation-centered standards development organization whose mission is to inspire the creation and the implementation of integrated performance standards that meet the changing global aviation environment and further ensure the safety, security, and the overall health of the aviation ecosystem. Now, in addition to developing standards, we also provide training to government and industry personnel on the application of those standards in developing the basis for certification and testing. And on the screen, you can see some of our upcoming training events. Uh, in April, we have two courses, um, one scheduled on uh, DO-160G, environmental testing, and a second one on DO-254, uh, design assurance guidelines for airborne electronic hardware. And you can sign up for any of these courses via our, via our website, at www.rtca.org. If you are interested or have any questions about our training, our standards development work, and are interested in becoming part of the RTCA family of members so that you too can have a voice in developing those standards, you can again contact us directly through our website or via telephone. Our ability to bring you these webinars would not be possible without the generous sponsorships from our industry partners. Today, I'm uh, especially thankful to Collins Aerospace, our gold corporate sponsor this year, and to the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, one of our other corporate sponsors for today's event. So let's get started. Now, while our, our past webinars have focused primarily on technical topics, this month we're doing something completely different. As a standards development organization, RTCA has a, has a rich background of success uh, dating back to 1935, when we developed our first standard for anti-static antennas on aircraft. That history of success is based on a number of factors, including ensuring that you have the brightest minds from diverse backgrounds working together for a, a single purpose, and that's to enhance the safety, efficiency, and efficacy of aviation safety on behalf of the traveling public. However, sometimes those bright minds come to the table with competing interests, and therefore sometimes they have differences of opinion. And that's where RTCA steps in with our staff, working together with industry leadership uh, to provide them a venue so that they can work collectively, collaboratively, and in an environment of civility where all voices are heard and respected, all with the purpose to ensure stakeholder success for all the participants in the process. Now, a few months ago, through a mutual friend, I was introduced to Shelby Joyce Gabro. Shelby has a background as a member of a former US president's advance team and a protocol officer in the US Department of State. 
Shelby is the founder of Practical Protocol, LLC, a consulting and event management firm that produces world-class events for high-level clients from around the world. She's worked with such notable figures as Pope, Paul, uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, Queen Elizabeth, Margaret Thatcher, Nelson Mandela, and a whole host of former presidents from both political parties. She's an internationally recognized speaker, entrepreneur, and author. And one of her most recent books, Civility Rules, is a must read. I'll add that she comes from an aviation family that has an amazing background. I know it's one you're gonna hear a little bit more about today. After an introductory presentation, Shelby will be joined by three of our outstanding special committee leaders, Mr. Steve Cook of Northrop Grumman, Mr. Jim Williams of JHW Unmanned Solutions, and Professor Chuck LaBerge of the University of Maryland. Also joining the interactive session with these folks will be Ms. Rebecca Morrison, one of RTCA's program directors, who provides technical support and oversees many of our special committees. For the audience, there'll be some time to take your questions as well. So as the uh, webinar progresses, you'll be able to submit questions to Shelby and our panelists. And to do so, just click on the comment question mark icon, type in your question, and we'll be sure to share the questions with them after the panel discussion. So without any further ado, please welcome Ms. Shelby Joy Scarborough. Shelby? Terry, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm, uh, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about civility, as you said, but I'd like to take us on a journey first. I'd like to take us back to 1933. And I'd like to think, th none of us were there. I, I'm pretty sure none of us were there, but we all kind of know what was happening at that time. And it was a depression. It was a great depression. And the country and the world was, was suffering a bit. Um, one of the thoughts I had was, was there, did civility rule in that time? You know, we always think we're in the worst of times or the best of times, but did civility actually rule at that time? I'm not sure, but what I know did was hope. People were trying to find anything to grasp onto, to believe in, to, to find a greater purpose. And I think civility is one of those purposes because we have to get joined together, to work together, to get anything done in a civilized society. So let me talk about a guy who was busy at that time trying to live his purpose. That guy was Jimmy Mattern. He was a pioneer aviator. He was a young, very enthusiastic guy who all he ever wanted to do was fly. And he had some great ideas. He had done a lot of firsts in flight, but he wanted to figure out something that was really going to put him on the map. In a June day in 1933, he took off. It's not changing. There we go. He, he, oops, he took off from Floyd Bennett Field in New York City, just outside of New York, and he was going to be the first man to fly around the world solo. Now, if you can imagine that kind of activity at that time, obviously we knew that at, already that Lindbergh had flown across the Atlantic solo, and that was a long, lonely trip. But this is in 1933 now, and he wants to be the guy to fly around the world by himself solo and kind of get that magic mark on his on his resume. You know, he was ambitious, but he didn't have a lot of the things that you guys work on today. He didn't have all those great avionics. He didn't have those tools, those standards, anything to work with. All he had was an altimeter. He had his hand to reach out and de-ice the, the windows as they iced up along the way. And he had an, a cup, an orange or two and a couple of chocolate bars to keep him satisfied on his trip. So can you imagine, you know, there's no, um, there's no pressurization, there's nothing. And so you of all people know this, this, this to the, the hardship now that that must have been. He took off in his Lockheed Vega with a Pratt Whitney engine that was specially constructed for him and it had, was cut, it was from stem to stern, from tip to toe all in, in uh, gas tanks. One of them was on loan from Amelia Earhart herself because she was behind his, act, his um, energy and wanted to see him succeed. He, it was going quite well for a while. He had stopped in Norway. He made it from New York to Norway, um, and it was a little rough, but he made it. Then he went on uh, to Berlin, and then he went on to uh, fly over the Soviet Union. And he had his permissions, but and he had planned everything. If you can imagine what it takes to get gas, gasoline, and fuel and oil um, in this kind of environment, um, 1933, when communications were very, very poor, and especially our 
communication in general with the Soviet Union, but he had this all arranged. He took off for one of his last legs where he was going to be flying um, from over Siberia and into Alaska, but he got a little bit of bad oil and he didn't totally realize it until too late. So he crashed and he was in Siberia in the tundra by himself, feared to be completely lost forever. He survived on not much, on the remaining chocolate bars and he found duck eggs and things like that. And it was pretty brutal out there. He'd broken his ankle. He crash landed the plane that he took off the wheels of the plane so that he wouldn't tip over on the tundra and he skid like a sled about a mile away from the river he was trying to land near so that he could be, he figured this Anadir River would give him the opportunity to be found if anybody was going to be out there. He was eventually found about two, two and a half weeks later, really pretty close to, you know, giving up hope, uh, losing all hope of m not just making the around the world flight solo and making that record. At this point, it was just about being alive. And he was humbled. He was brought to his knees, literally, about how this was going to end. So he was rescued by these nomadic fur traders. They took him in. They really never been with somebody like him before. They'd never seen a, this kind of plane up close. And so they took him in. They took him eventually with some coaxing and with no common language, no common ground, no common way to communicate with each other. They managed to get him into Anadir, Siberia, which was the populated town where they sold their furs. And he had a radio operator who called to um, Moscow because that was the only link. And they um, ended up sending Stalin was the one who um, had known about my grandfather. Uh, he had held him as a spy just the year before when they crash landed in Minsk with a co-pilot on a, on a different kind of adventure. And as held as spies, he didn't have a really great feeling about the Soviet Union at that point. But I think Stalin saw this as an opportunity to kind of make amends and get a mark for himself. And he sent Levinevsky, who was the first, uh, he was the Russian Lindbergh. And he sent Levinevsky up to take, to pick him up in Anadir and take him to Nome, Alaska, where Jimmy Mattern picked up another plane and finished his flight. You know, it's Jimmy's mission was to get a title, but in a way he was really trying to connect the world. He saw that this was a great place of hope for this world to connect us together, to bring cultures together, to show that great things could be done with purpose and with energy behind it. And as I transition into talk, my talk about civility in this and where does this fit, you know, we have to see that this is a great hope for us at this point in time because we, we are living in a rather uncivil world. I started looking into this because George Washington wrote a book called The Rules of Civility. He felt, he wrote these from an, a lesson book uh, from given to him by one of his teachers, I think, and he um, he he really took those to heart. I think it might have even been a writing assignment, but he took those rules to heart, 110 rules about behavior in society. And they were originally written even a century earlier for um, nobles in France. But, you know, it doesn't have to be noble to be have good manners, to think about others, and to have civility. So he kind of made these for the common man, for the everyday activity. And there's lots of funny rules, like thou shalt not stand so close so as to bedew a man with one spittle. So I found I find that funny. But if you think about it, in COVID times, it's become even more important. We got to stand far enough away so that we don't contaminate someone else with our um, our germs at this point. So these some of these things kind of come around again. And even though they sound funny and archaic, they're they're very useful. He wrote these rules and what I did with them is I took them and tore them apart and put them back together so that they made sense for, for today's world. I look at this slide and I think of the song, you know, he's got the whole world in his hands. And uh, George Washington was a great leader who cared about his country. He wanted to see his country grow and prosper. He really was humble at heart about it. And he knew though that we needed to um, step up and and, rise to the occasion at every moment. So just to get us on kind of a common playing field here, the, def the many definitions in, uh, this is kind of boils down to some of the dictionary definitions of civility, being politeness and courtesy and behavior or speech, or polite remarks used in formal conversation. Well, I don't find that sufficient. 
I think civility is far more. Really, civility is about trust. We have all of these rules that George Washington wrote, and all of them can be bucketed into the into these pillars of trust, respect, honor, empathy, courtesy, personal responsibility, and I think the most important one is humility. Intellectual humility to know that we may know our stuff. You all are experts in everything that you're doing in your industry. But even as an expert, even as a skilled and experienced person in your industry and in your world, we can all still learn something. And that's what humility is about. Intellectual humility is about understanding that even though we might be right or we feel we're right, we actually could be wrong. There could be something that we could learn. And to keep our minds and our hearts open to that. Trust and respect are much more about how are we trustworthy? Are we worthy of respect? Are we living a life that people can respect? Not, can I respect others? Not, do I trust others? We have to take matters into our own hands when it comes to civility. And that's where the personal responsibility part comes in. We can't point fingers and blame other people for an incivil world if we're not doing our part to make it civil. So we have to keep continue to think what we can do to add to that. This is Leo Tolstoy. And he said, you know, everyone thinks of changing the world. Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks to change himself. And this is the premise of my book, is about looking into ways that we can do something about changing our world one person at a time, one civil interaction at a time. Sometimes incivility is easier to identify. And that things like ego, um, lack of self-esteem is one of the one things that comes out with incivility. Sometimes people are so stressed, they've got personal circumstances that, that make them short. Well, they, maybe they shouldn't be, but it happens. So that's where our empathy comes in to see that, to try to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. So some of you may have known this, but there is this is a, a, a perspective exercise here. And if you look at this, I, I'm pretty sure you guys see a lady. The question is, what lady do you see? Do you see an old lady? Do you see a young lady? Because both of those are there. You can see both of those if you look carefully. So for those of you who see an old lady, you see her nose and her the red part below is her mouth and she's wearing a hat of white. Um, and her bangs are coming down over her eyes. For those of you who see a young lady, her chin is the nose of the old lady, and her mouth, her the choker, uh, the red, the mouth of the old lady is actually the choker of a young woman. Does everybody see that? You know, it's really helpful to keep our perspective in mind when we're trying to be civil with other people. Sometimes it's really hard, you know? The bottom line is civility, if it were easy, everybody'd be doing it. And clearly we've got a problem with everybody doing it. So I'd like to ask the panel of guests that we have put together for you today that are members of your organization. I'd like to ask them to join me. And we'd like to have a little conversation here to make it real for you, to make this concept of civility real for you. I've asked the panelists in advance to think about some stories that they might share on the concepts of trust or respect or empathy, personal responsibility and courtesy to see if, if we can bring this into reality and see how we can make this kind of actionable in our own world in some examples. And I'd love to welcome Chuck to the stage to ask him to share his story. Hi, I'm Chuck LaBerge. I'm the chair of Special Committee 222, which deals with aeronautical SATCOM for safety services. I've been working with RTCA since about 1978 or so, and I've noticed that the changes in committee participation have really stressed the rules of civility even in the RTCA environment. Early in my RTCA career, the systems that were being standardized were generally defined or supported by the government and the competitors in the room represented the radio and airframe manufacturers, all of whom were closely tied to the aviation industry. Boeing and Collins and Airbus and Honeywell and Bendix and Allied Signal and Cobham and Tallis and others, of course, all understood the ground rules and worked collegially to develop 
to mutually acceptable standards, all while advocating their own positions. But as aviation has changed to use more and more commercial infrastructure, Wi-Fi on aircraft, for example, or privately uh, operated SATCOM, the meetings have become more contentious. We've seen an increase in participation from those whose primary business is not aviation, but who wish to offer or standardize equipment to expand their market into the aviation world. In addition, the stresses on spectrum allocations and sharing make it more likely that non-aviation entities are playing a more significant role in our committees. As chair, I've noticed that within the last few years, we have I've had to play referee more and more to step in to keep the conversations what we would call civil. Uh, I understand the stress, the spectrum issues in particular were lots of dollars swamping the market for avionics that was the focus of earlier competition between participants. And that financial stress leads to more intensely held and promoted approaches and ideas and less willingness to compromise to achieve consensus and less appreciation for other points of view. So I kind of see this as, a, as multiple of Shelby's pillars here. There's mm -hmm. trust and there's respect and honor and humility. And I'm sure you can apply the others as well. So this is really something unusual and a little outside my comfort zone. And I want to thank Shelby and RTCA for the invitation to participate. Thank you very much. You know, it, 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 the irony for me is that you all set the standards for an industry. And this is a perfect example of how you can set the standard for how you communicate with each other in your meetings. And there are definitely some easy tools and tips and techniques that I can offer, and but I will kind of save that for a little bit later. Um, but things like listening to learn and, and how you communicate those kind of values to your organization. Thank you so much, Chuck. Jim Williams, can I ask you to come to the stage? Sorry, the mute button challenged me there. Um, <laughs> I thought well, I really enjoyed your your presentation. It brought up a whole bunch of uh, really good examples and and my experience. Uh, current, I've been involved with RTCA special committees since I believe 1990 ish uh, as members and as various leadership positions in different committees. And it's and it's always been important to be civil to be. Uh, to, well, I like to say it's okay to disagree, but you don't have to be disagreeable when you're having these discussions. I currently run RTCA's uh, special committee, a portion of the special committee that's working on unmanned aircraft system uh, standards for various aspects of how they work. Uh, particularly, I work on the communication links. And we were having a discussion uh, one day about how how a portion of what the FAA does works, which when I worked for the FAA before I, I left and became a consultant, uh, was something I was in charge of. So I was confident, I knew exactly what we were talking about, exactly how it was gonna be, but yet here's this FAA person who, who works in a different area, uh, essentially challenging me on, on how it worked. And I got, you know, fairly annoyed and, and let emotion creep in and became a little more disagreeable in my disagreements. Uh, and, and when, you know, calmer heads prevailed and we got down to really discussing the details, did a little research, it turns out that, yes, I was right, but so was he. And that something had changed. And his perspective about what we were talking about was different. It was... It was based on different information than mine. And so consequently, we later, you know, agreed on what the actual answer was and how it works in the in the real world and not just how I remembered it and, and what he was saying. So it wasn't, it was a great example of how, you know, my, my humility was um, lacking in that I should have been more willing to 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 really listen and understand what this individual is saying instead of just being convinced that I was right. So I, I just, there are so many aspects of what you've been talking about that are really important to what we do because our TCA works on consensus. It's, it's not a vote, so you kind of have to work until everybody can live with a solution. 
to do that, you might, you've got to be civil because as soon as emotions start creeping into the discussions, people take hard positions and you just really can never get to a point that everybody's happy with. So thank you so much for your presentation. And I'm going to, I'm going to go buy your book. <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, I, again, I heard another little irony in there that you work on unmanned missions and we're talking about mankind and humanity here and getting together. But you also talked about the comms links that needed to, to be uh, put in place for that. So even with an unmanned mission, we still have to work on communication and we still have to work together to get something like an unmanned uh, I'm look, with, looking for the word, an unmanned object, an unmanned <laughs> aircraft out there. Um, and in order for it to fly and come home again, we need to work together. Thank you so much, Jim. Steve, I'd love to hear you come to the stage. Thank you so much, Shelby. And I also really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, that history uh, about the, uh, the gentleman who tried to fly around the world, that's really fascinating. I never knew that story. Um, my name is Steve Cook. I am a, a fellow in airworthiness at Northrop Grumman Corporation, and I lead SC240, which is Special Committee 240, which is topics on software advancement. And um, I, I think one of the things that I've learned along the lines you were talking about, Shelby, is to really try to believe the best about someone else's motives unless you have reason to um, to think otherwise, like proof to think otherwise. And one example I, I gave is I was really trying to move a meeting along one time. Uh, we were prep, we were over, over our time. Uh, I could tell people were getting frustrated and, um, you know, this person just kept objecting. You know, I, I object, I object. And I was like, gosh, what is going on? You know, why is this person trying to slow us down? I can't believe this. So I said, let's take a break. And I pulled this person aside and I said, what's going on? You know, we're, we're, we're already over and we're trying to move forward. And you're really like, I, you're just trying to slow us down. You're just a roadblock. And the person said, you know, I, my sponsor said I had to, I had to get in the minutes. You know, my sponsor said that when they looked at the minutes, they wanted to see my name. And I figured the best way to do it since we're running so short a time is just to object to something. And I was like, okay, well, there's there's better ways there's better ways of doing it. But the fact that that he was able to share that I, I have this I have this need, and I'm not really Steve. You think I'm trying to slow you down, uh, but really I just have this other thing that I need. And so we were like, hey, well, let's get a win-win here. You know, we can definitely make sure that your name shows up in the minutes. That's not a problem, and we can get everyone moving forward and we can create a win-win situation. But, um, you know, my attitude towards that person was, was not civil um, because I saw that person as being trying to derail what I was trying to do. But when I actually had an opportunity to talk with that individual, it turns out that our purposes weren't at odds at all. We actually, um, he, just, he just needed something that was was relatively easy. So um, I think empathy uh, with that, Shelby, as you were mentioning, is is really big. And I also just think um, you know believing the best about someone and 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 giving someone a break and um, you know stepping out of your own shoes and putting yourself in another person's shoes sometimes can can really help to uh, bring about civility and um, can can really help to to move things forward. So yes. thank, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. You know, it's really a beautiful point that if you get to the why behind the what, a lot of times you can you can make a lot of progress. And sometimes it's just not there. It's just below the surface, and you have to dig a little. So it was good on you to to call a timeout and step aside and figure it out. Because if you hadn't, it might have just gone on into an uglier situation. And the win win is a great way to do that. Um, you know, zero sum game, there's only one winner and why can't we all try for a win-win? Um, giving credit where credit is due is an interesting concept there. And he, he had to, it's interesting how he had to kind of achieve that credit, but that could have been done in another way too. I know it's mm -hmm. awkward sometimes to say, I need some credit for something, um, right. but being upfront and honest uh, is a, probably a better policy. Thank you so much. Rebecca, can I call you to the stage? Sure. Thank you, Shelby. 
And thank you so much for your presentation. We've been looking forward to this for several months since Terry told us about it. Excuse me. My name is Rebecca Morrison and I'm a program director at RTCA. I've been here almost five years and I'm currently the program director for nine active special committees. But the, the story I wanna tell you is not about my role as program director, but when I was representing RTCA in a cross industry discussion about spectrum, and everyone knows that spectrum doesn't leave a lot of room for civility. It's a, a hot topic. It's a lot about money, but it's also about safety when we're talking about aviation. And I was there to represent and be the ears for RTCA as we were continuing to have this conversation about shared spectrum. So I wasn't leading and um, I was not there, there was someone who was a member of RTCA who was volunteering to be the leader of the committee. I was there more for awareness and also to be sure I understood the issues and could report that back to Al Season, my boss and Terry, the president of RTCA. But what struck me, and, and it was it started last spring through all last summer, was the very formal tone of all the conversations. It is very easy when you put two engineers from the same company, let alone from different industries who have their vision of what they wanna see implemented, for them to not hear how they're speaking, for them to not hear how their words sound to someone else. But the leaders, and especially the, the, the logistical leader of the meeting, brought such a tone of formality to everything we did. It was, thank you for your question. Thank you for participating. Thank you for your perspective. It was, there's rules that we get taught by Dale Carnegie to, to validate the other person, to say, you know, to give them confidence to speak. And I have to say, in the beginning, especially the engineers who were participating, they were very passionate about what they had to uh, say and defend about their industry, about their company, about their implementations. But probably by six weeks in, because of the formality of speech, because the leader never raised her voice, people came to the meetings much calmer. So I think that it, it is an example of how showing respect and not letting your behavior change because of how you are behaved to can help set a tone. And also her confidence absolutely made it that, you know, People didn't feel like they weren't going to get to speak. People didn't feel like they weren't going to be heard. And that made it better. I can't say that it was our goal. My goal as a program director is always our standards get to the PMC and all non-concurs are resolved and we are all singing kumbaya. <laughs> that wasn't necessarily the result, but I still have such respect for her for the gentleman who was, was her co-lead and everyone who participated because the conversation's not over. And that's something to remember. The way you treat another person with respect will make a difference even if you never agree on the technical point. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I hear you know that confident voices can sometimes overshadow uh, not so confident voices sometimes, but people may have equal uh, knowledge and input. And when you're talking about something so important as safety, aviation safety, it's really important that every voice be heard. Um, that, 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 that's the point of leadership that you talked about, that this um, committee chair was able to lead and be through civility. You know, it takes patience to do that, though. It's not easy because it's a whole lot easier to just say, please do as I say. Um, but we need to have please do as I say, because I'm doing what I'm saying I'm doing, and I'm doing the same thing I'm asking you to do. I ask you to join with me on this journey. It takes a little bit of EQ, emotional quotient, emotional intelligence. And sometimes in the, um, how shall I say this civilly, sometimes in a world that's very quantifiable, that's, that's hard facts, that's black and white, that's up or down, sometimes the softer skills, the, the communication skills and the way to wind things together and have people kind of buy into a, a subject or buy into a way of thinking of things gets, can get a little lost there sometimes. And so emphasizing that in what we do when we collaborate together is such a great way to do it. And having standards of conduct as well as standards for your industry. 
I'm going to ask you all to hang around a little bit. If you want to turn your cameras off, that's fine, and you can mute yourselves, but we will uh, bring you back at the end for some questions, and I'm going to go back a little bit and turn to yet another perspective. You know, you talked about spectrum and safety, so I noticed that spect is the same thing as perspective, the root word of a, a view, a different view. So let's look at civility from a different view. So I, as I was going through uh, writing this book, I, I wrote the final bit on July 4th of last year, sitting on my front porch. It was very quiet 4th of July because of COVID. So I used the time to really go inward and think through this whole subject of civility and what it was meaning to me. And I reflected on a speech that I heard um, a man named John Harmer, who was, who kind of coincidentally actually was President Reagan's lieutenant governor in California. And so he was an older gentleman who'd seen a lot of things and he was speaking to the board of directors that, I, that I'm on for the Freedoms Foundation at Valley Forge, which teaches, um, it teaches civility basically, but it teaches the founding documents to high school kids and to high school teachers so that they can carry on and understand the depth of the meaning of our constitution, the Bill of Rights and all of those things. So he said something that really rang true to me. Civility is at the core of freedom and democracy. So why is that? Why is that? It's because when there's only one voice in the room, there is no freedom. There's no democracy. So for me, that just stuck with me. It's like, you know, this is super important. This is, I keep like discounting myself. Well, civility, people think of it as manners and it's just frivolous, but you know what? It's not. It's at the core of everything we do. And if you just look at what's happened in the last year or three years or five years, even 10 years, because I've been writing about this for a long time, this is not just a new phenomenon, that we need to really focus on civility. Doesn't mean so that we don't talk about what we need to talk about, that we don't have hard conversations. It's quite the opposite. We need to have hard conversations, but we can't do it if only one voice dominates. If only one voice and one party one government, one company, one CEO, one committee member dominates the situation. We need to balance that out. And I think I want to go to, a, to, to show the leadership and the, the civility of my first boss. My first boss when I got out of college was Ronald Reagan. How, you know, how lucky was I? I couldn't have had a better example of civility. A man who I mean, you know, some people think this is old fashioned, even sexist at this point, but who always wanted to hold the door for everybody. He held the door for everyone, although in his time as president, you know, people held doors for him. But when we would be together, he would say, you know, after you. And I would say, no, sir, after you, because I was an advanced person. So I was supposed to be in advance, but meaning letting him go first into an elevator. But he didn't do that. He was very kind. And every time I saw him, even when he was telling fun jokes, he had these great jokes that he would tell, but he um, he was very polite and very civil with absolutely everybody. And he thought about the needs of others in everything he did. I could tell you story after story, but for lack of time, I just want to share one thing that we all kind of know in general, but a little bit from the behind the scenes perspective. You know, he did say, and this is, I don't have the exact quote, so I'm calling it a Ronald Reagan-ism, but it's not freedom fund responsibility, it's freedom with responsibility. So the responsibility, civility is right in the middle and in the heart of that as far as I'm concerned. When he first met General, Gor General Secretary Gorbachev, this was in Reykjavik, Iceland. When they first met, they, you know, they had a cordiality about them. They went and they sat, they did a fireside chat, which looks maybe a little bit of like my background here, a comfortable situation. That wasn't, that was deliberate to put these two people in a situation where they could communicate with each other, you know, and the United States trying to get together to see what we could do about nuclear, arm, nuclear arms and our relationship in general. And, you know, the president Reagan wanted always to have a good relationship, but he kept saying, you know, they keep dying on me. All the leaders of the Soviet Union kept dying. And then along came Gorbachev and he thought, you know, I could work with this guy. So he came, they came together. And as you can see, there's something that's called rapport in the way they sit. Now, if you're from the Middle East, you wouldn't like the fact that you could see the bottoms of their shoes, which goes back to my history as a protocol officer. But in, in general, in this great picture, they obviously have rapport. They're facing each other. They're, they are crossing their legs, they're both crossing their legs, they're smiling, et cetera. This is a really important emotional intelligence quality is to try to get in rapport with somebody. So they built this relationship 
Um, they met each other. They actually stepped away from the table a couple of times because they couldn't agree. So they stepped away, and they, but they kept coming back to the table, which I think is a really important point. Eventually, there was an opportunity for President Reagan to speak at the Berlin Wall. This is particularly of interest to me because I was there. And actually, I was in most of these places as well. But I had just stood, I had a picture with my uh, colleagues standing right behind that stage in front of the Berlin Wall, which is a very memorable experience, knowing that he was going to say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I'd flown in with them from Venice. We had just done an economic summit, and my boss said, why don't you come along, uh, manifested me on, on the plane, and we flew into uh, Tempelhof Airport, and I'm remembering Jimmy Mattern told me one time that when you fly into Tempelhof, get ready for the fl the plane to drop because it comes over the buildings and it's going to drop. So I told all my colleagues on the plane, this is what's going to happen, and sure enough, it did. So it was a kind of a fun way to bring a few things together. So I was drinking beer and bratwurst off to the right side of the stage while he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. We had speakers into East Germany, not a soul in sight in East Germany, but the crowds were amazing in West Germany at the time. And now, if you've gone there recently, you know that it's a, a vibrant center of dialogue and information and culture. And, and it's just a beautiful thing that's happened to Berlin since this speech. And, but he knew he had the confidence of the relationship with Gorbachev to be able to say that those words because it wasn't a challenge. If you listen to the whole speech, it was, it was a personal challenge. It wasn't a threat. And so I think that this is a really important concept is if you value democracy, if you value freedom, tear down this wall, show that you care, come to us. He did that eventually, obviously, actually it came down, but it was because he stepped back in the Soviet Union. And there's a lot of per per people who could, uh, we could have lots of long dialogue about this, the fall of the Soviet Union and what caused that overall. But here, this is in the middle of the Kremlin and I, I, I'm too small to see, but I'm in the far left corner in a white shirt uh, and was able to watch this, witness this signing of this treaty um, in a wonderful environment. And he, they they accomplish great things together because of this relationship because they learn to to believe in each other individually learn to trust one another even at the end even, this is at the white house i mean the embrace it, it's all, it says it all and they were friends till the end of of president reagan's life and he even came to the funeral i was in charge of um the deputy in charge of the process in Washington, D.C. for President Reagan's funeral and was there with General Secretary Gorbachev when he touched this coffin. That was President Reagan's coffin in the heart of the Capitol uh, when he lay in state. So this, these are the kind of relationships that we can build for a lifetime. And I'm reminded as I, I see that relationship, I think back to what was going on with me at the time and we were dealing with the Soviets. And so one of our key um, counterparts was a man named David Chikvaids, and he we we thought we wondered if he was a spy. I was a protocol officer, you know. Um, I was sort of in charge of babysitting him when he was in the State Department. Sometimes when uh, Shevard Nazi would come to meet the Secretary of State George Schultz at the time. And just a couple of years ago, I was in Geneva with him. After all these years, he's now uh, the chef de cabinet at the. Uh, United Nations in Geneva, and we've spent, this is not just the only time, but we've spent a few years, every time I go to Geneva, we get together and eat steak with truffles and have a wonderful friendship that started because of the divergent views of two nations. You know, for me, joy and civility are very important concepts that go together because if you think about it, joy without civility how easy it is, is it to be joyful? And my middle name is Joy, as, as Terry said at the beginning. So I kind of own this in, in my sense when I think about civility. I want to bring joy to the people around me. I want to enjoy my life. I want to believe that the world can be joyful. And I believe that civility is a pathway for that because if, it's, if we have joy, it, civility is much more possible. And if we have civility, joy is much more possible. So I think of them as two sides of the same coin. And I think that when we, when we take this perspective, it's just, a, it's just a simple way of grabbing the moment and, and putting ourselves in that moment and being able to deal with circumstances as they come. One situation that happened that brought great joy to me that was 
spontaneous in a way, was I was organizing the trip of Pope John Paul II to Poland to open up the wing of a children's hospital. And we had had all of the children who were well enough, they were a lot cancer patients, et cetera, in their pajamas and um, hairless, and they were so cute sitting on these uh, little wooden stools. And the Pope consecrated the wing of the hospital, and then he went around and touched the head of every single child. Um, he may have known he was going to do that, but we didn't, even in all our planning. And so it took my breath away just to see, and, and I'm wearing my orange because I'm Protestant, not Catholic, but the Pope took my breath away with the fact that he was connecting literally connecting to every child in that room to bless them as he consecrated the wing of the children's hospital. And then he went outside and gave a magnificent speech and this was the entrance to the children's hospital and the memory of that is burned in my brain forever. The Dalai Lama said, when you think everything is someone else's fault, when you realize that everything springs only from yourself, you will learn both peace and joy. And that's my point, is that when we take personal responsibility and we stop pointing fingers as a society and even as individuals at somebody else's behavior we and take ownership of our own and not worry so much about what somebody else is doing, I do believe that we can spread that, that we can start a movement, that we can be a part of a solution. We have the opportunity to rise above everything. And if you think of what Jimmy Mattern did, rising above and taking that risk to be that lone guy who, who struck out to do something big, we can do that too. We can do this on our own. You know, let me tell you a little bit about more about Jimmy Mattern. He came back from that trip and he did a few other things. He got married. Uh, he, he became the, uh, he was the lead engineering test pilot for the P-38, for the Lockheed P-38. And that ended his career eventually because, as in flying because he got uh, basically got an aneurysm and a, a, a bubble in his brain and they told him he shouldn't fly anymore. And while it, it sort of, it definitely affected him, he knew that his purpose was greater in many ways than just flying. He was such an inspiration to the astronauts of the time. They, when he passed away, the pre President Reagan wrote a note and said, we stood on your shoulders to reach the stars. And this was so true because these astronauts all looked up to him. You know, he was, he was their mentor. He was their precursor. He was one of the guys. And he, because he lived for such a long time into this, or into this history, he saw such a, a vast um, bridge of history. This is his pilot's license, and it was signed by Orville Wright. It went to the moon. It was also signed by Jimmy. And Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took it to the moon, where they signed it, and it says Tranquility Base. This is, to me, this is the embodiment of bringing together all the disparate parts of everything and coming together as a group and recognizing the, the energy, the perseverance, the undaunted attitude that people had to take to get things done in this time period. And if we take that and move that into this topic of trying to create a more civil world, I think it's really possible, but we have to focus on it. Jimmy got married to the love of his life and he had two daughters and six grandchildren. And that one encircled on the right is me. So Jimmy Mattern was my grandfather and I couldn't be prouder to be his granddaughter We've just finished writing a book. The timing of this speech is just, it's actually Providence because when Terry talked to me about it, I was so excited to hear that I would be speaking to you all because this is such a huge part of our family story and it's my delight to share that with you in the context of both hope, ambition, perseverance, and civility. He was a very generous and gracious grandfather. He loved us all and he lived till 1988 and we were so lucky to know him. I think that this book is just coming out. It's on it's on Kindle right now. It's not it's not available for sale. But when we think about things like that, and I go back to George Washington, the roots of this civility discussion is that we have to forgive ourselves a little bit. We are human, and we are talking about human things. We need to think that we're, know that we're a work in progress. George Washington knew that he was a work in progress. You know, he struggled with the concept of slavery his whole life, and he ended up freeing his slaves at the end of his life. He, he knew that people were deserving of dignity and respect, and he, he 
learned throughout his life and he grew. And I think that's a super important part of all of this when we think about civility. So I like to tell this story. Um, well, this is, first of all, this is the last, um, the last rule in the book is labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire called conscience. And I think that's at the heart of everything is thinking about our conscience and doing what's right. And um, sometimes that's not always about being right. And it's willing to give away credit. It's willing to be patient and not have to be the loudest voice in the room. And I always find that uh, aspect of humility and things a little embarrassing as I'm the one speaking to you. But I come to you with great humility. I'm a constant learner and I try to keep co my conscience front and forward. Finally, this, there's a gentleman named Manfred Werner who was the Secretary General of NATO. And I had him as a visit when I was a protocol officer and we went to the White House, which is what we typically did. When we left, he went out and got in his car and I was standing there on the curb with a colleague of mine just outside the West Wing. And we were waving goodbye. Suddenly the car stops and he gets out and he was tall, had long, long legs and he runs knee to chin, runs back. Of course, I'm sure Secret Service on the grounds were wondering what was happening. And uh, fortunately, no arms came out that I could see. But they came run he came running back to us and said, I forgot to thank you. So I always try to end a little bit with that story because I just want to sh share my gratitude with you and show that gratitude is such a beautiful thing in this world. And showing that to other people can change the world as well. It's part of being civil. It's part of civility. You know, I'm so grateful to you all because you keep us safe. I'm so grateful to my, every time I get on a plane, I think of my grandfather and I say thanks to him for what he did to help connect the world and make it a smaller place so that I can go gallivanting all around the world with a message of civility and hope. And I wanna thank you for having me here today. Terry, if you'd like to come back and our panelists, I know that some people may have some questions and we're happy, happy to do that. Oh, great, thanks, Shelby. Um, wow, when I said at the beginning, I hope we always hope these webinars uh, will be a source of inspiration, and and I think you you certainly hit it out of the park uh, in your messaging today. Um, one question uh, that came through, um, you know, a lot of people think of civility as this common sense. It's kind of the way we were raised. You know, be polite, full in conversations, mm -hmm. uh, respect the other person, but we also know that there are some people maybe weren't raised the same way we were they're hotheads all the time and and maybe it's a question for the panelists as well but is is the role to try to change them can they be changed um what do you think nope nope <laughs> the only the only thing we can control is our own behavior and our attempts to control other people's behavior fail miserably every time and that but we can change other people's behavior by by being the example and not in a righteous way not in an arrogant way but being truly humble by by recognizing other people's humanity by showing respect and trust in other people and being worthy of trust and respect that's the best way to change another person and if everybody worked at it if everybody made it a practice of civility, like I'm trying to do. And again, a practice, it's not, you don't flip a switch. <laughs> so if everybody did that, I do believe we can change the behavior of other people, but not by telling them how to behave. Any of the panelists, have you had run into that in some of your, your work, either out doing the standards work or in your uh, other professional life, or maybe even in your personal life? <laughs> Well, I, I definitely run into it in standards work. I mean, there, there are certain individuals whose whose approach to uh, interactions with other people is, you know, less than what we would want it to be, shall we say, to be to be civil about it. Uh, and and so rather than rather than tell them how awful they are, uh, it's it's better to focus on the results. That when mm -hmm. when someone is being disruptive and pushing something beyond what would normally be considered civil. I always like to take them aside and say, you know, you're not you're not getting the results I think you want. You know, you you want to change people's opinions, but your approach is doing the opposite. You're just forcing them to take hard positions because your, you know, your your tactics, shall we say, are are not being productive. And that that has worked with individuals. I mean it they don't really change their behavior, but sometimes it helps them to change their approach 
to, you know, because they realize that they suddenly realize that, well, this isn't going to work. I've got to do something different. Yeah, I'd like to say a couple things on that, if I could, just uh, real briefly. Um, one thing, just like Jim was saying, um, a phrase I like to use is let's go hard on the problem and go soft on the people. So if we can focus that passion <clears throat> towards actually constructive solutions, a lot of times that energy that that person's putting into um, sort of, as you were saying, Terry, like being hot headed, if it's directed at the problem, that can be a really helpful thing for the committee because we can solve we need people that are passionate that can can solve the problem. And and I think that's been um, my experience is that um, I've certainly had some occasions where, uh, you know, I feel like I've gone 10 rounds with someone. And if we can figure out a way to, um, you know, peacefully coexist or become more aligned, I like that passion if it's directed at the problem I'd rather have a person like that than have people that just come to the committee meetings and just sit and don't really contribute anything so sometimes um, that passion can be a really good thing if it can be directed um, in towards a constructive solution Terry, if I, I could add something like that that one of the things not everyone knows is that everyone who's participating in the creation of OTCA standards, who's bringing content is coming as a volunteer. Everyone has their own position in their organization, but when they come into the room for OTCA, you're all equally volunteers. There's the chairman, there's the secretary, but everyone has a voice. And that takes away from a program director's and a chair's perspective, a lot of the sticks, right? If, if, if you're all within the same organization, you know, they can say, I'm going to go talk to your boss. But here it is, a, it, it is leveling that way. And so it is your own behavior that earns your respect within the committee. And it also makes it harder for our chairs. <laughs> Perfect. Um, uh, Shelby, in your book, you I think you tell a story about uh, Abraham Lincoln, and it, it has it has to do with that point about humility, and it, it, and humility doesn't require us to abandon our self confidence, and I love that line. And you talked a little bit about it today. Can you tell just a little bit more on your thoughts on that? Sure. You know, again, it, it it's that balance of humility. Humility isn't the lack. Of self con of of confidence or the lack of ego, it's actually balanced. If you think of it on a continuum, if you have um, humility is in the center of a continuum. So on the right side or on, the, on one side, you have complete ego with no humility whatsoever, and then on the on the other side, you have zero self confidence and zero ability to. You're a mushroom basically. So you know we have to find ourselves a balance in the middle where we have enough self confidence to be able to address things and have conversations and be a part of humanity and be engaged, but uh, but just enough intellectual humility that we know that we could be wrong and we could be learners, that we need to, to have an attitude or a mantle of lifelong learning and always be open to, I might not have, I didn't know that. <laughs> I find myself saying that a lot. Um, <laughs> any other thoughts from the panel on, on uh... A balance between um, humility and um, self-confidence. We You're see also that humble. in yeah. <laughs> we see that in our uh, special committee a lot. As I mentioned, we do have a lot of uh, commercial interests who come in, and they have different ways of looking at things. And at first, they're at loggerheads, and then you realize, well they're actually looking at it the same way they're just using different terms because they come from different organizations for the same thing and if we can find that point of consensus a lot of times what appears to be a problem tends to go away yeah very good very good um also in in your book Shelby, you, you talk about I think several congressmen that really had a knack for being able to work across the aisle with their their uh, folks that were had probably different philosophical positions politically. Um, 
and, and you mentioned that those that are really successful in doing that have the ability to be good listeners, but without um, compromising their positions. Um, tell me more, tell us more about that. <laughs> well, we'd like to see more of that than we're seeing at this point in time. Um, Bob, Bob Dold is one of the people I talk about in the book. He is a personal friend. I, I've known him since he was 18 and he was a two-time congressman. He may go back again, you never know. He's from Chicago. Uh, he might run for Senate. I don't know, maybe even president. I think he would be a good candidate overall. He was a very moderate Republican. He felt that working together with uh, the Democratic Party and his colleagues was super important. And you know, they used to do things like have picnics on the grounds of the Capitol with their families. And they also, their families used to live closer, but now with aviation, thanks so much to everybody here, people fly home a lot and their families remain in their districts, which has its advantages too. But it, the, one of the negatives is that they don't have that community feeling amongst themselves anymore. That's just one of the issues. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one, I'm, I'm reminded of a story of, um, of Dianne Feinstein, Senator Feinstein, uh, many, many years ago uh, with, uh, a, a, when she was new. Um, and Charlie Wilson, if you'll uh, if you'll remember him, he was he served in Congress. Um, uh, Charlie Wilson's War is a movie that was made by him. Uh, I mean, made about him. He was my neighbor in Arlington for a while, and he, we lived on a, an apartment building, so he, we shared a balcony, and it was quite an interesting experience being his neighbor so close. Um, one of the things that he did was he he welcomed a, senator, a new Senator Feinstein into the office, and I don't remember all of the details, but for the most part, the bottom line is he said something about, called her baby cakes. Now, could you imagine, <laughs> could you imagine that today? And she showed grace and a sense of humor, which I think is super important. And in all this uh, division and um, polarization and labels and, you know, individualism that we're going through right now, she responded, well, that's Senator baby cakes to you. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, just one final question. I think this is probably something that each of the panelists may want to weigh in on. Um, and, and you talked a little bit about it in your presentation today too, Shelby, in terms of uh, uh, Washington and his his role as somebody that was very good at building trust um, and the and the power of the character to really be that driving factor of building that trust. And when we talk about leadership, whether it's leadership in our committees or leadership in our, our daily lives, how what can we be doing um, or, or how best to establish that, um, that, that trust, that to build that character so that you can be an effective leader? You know, I, I think it's a matter of you know, in protocol, we put uh, we put a lot of emphasis on where people are seated at a table, like when, when there's a meeting. So who's in charge? Who's the, you know, and the Japanese do it one way and they put them across at the ends or across and or the big kahuna is sitting against the wall is in Japanese society. A lot of times you'll the, the most important person in the room is actually not at the table, which I think has an interesting symbolism to it. Um, again, the humility, the sort of I want to listen, I want to learn, I want to see the dynamics and, and then I'll, you know, know what to do. Uh, rather than dictating what's going on at the table. So we, you know, a little bit of servant leadership, I think, is a way to put it that I like to look at it, is to think about ourselves as uh, as leaders, is that we don't need to be in charge, we need to be in command, but we don't need to always be in charge. We need, we, and to share that experience with other people, to bring people into the fold, um, have them be advocates for what you're trying to do and not, so that we're not just pounding something into somebody else. My dad, as an entrepreneur, uh, we're an entrepreneurial family, and my dad um, would say, it's uh, own, own, taking ownership. Mm -hmm. So being the owner doesn't mean you do everything. It means you help everybody else succeed and being a leader is about make is now about me, making others succeed uh, at what they're doing if if you were not the in charge you would be doing a project and a, and some some form of the bigger picture but if you're in charge your job is to make sure that everybody else is empowered to get their job done right any other thoughts from the panelists on, on the issue of trust well, as a leader? <laughs> Go ahead, Chuck. Thanks, thanks, Shelby. Uh, uh, I want to say that's exactly the experience that I struggle with in being the chair 
because for most of my RTCA career, I've been the guy doing the math and writing the actual words and doing the analyses and saying, this is what the spec ought to be. And it's a completely different role being a chair and now trying to step back from that, despite how much I want to do it. Right. <laughs> and, and, and try and facilitate others to do it in a way that mm -hmm. RTCA can actually publish. Mm -hmm. uh, and because that's sometimes an issue with, uh, with these various organizations. Yeah, it's, Shelby, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I can, I can, I feel your pain. P patience, perseverance. Those are good keywords. Right. <laughs> Yeah, no, you you hit you said something that really resonated with me when I, I was I was 20 years of my time with the FAA. I was a uh, a manager and then an executive, and a lot of our I had a lot of opportunities to mentor people, you know, younger people who were thinking about going into management. And I at, being in an engineering organization, you know, a lot of these folks were engineers, and I used to always tell them when they talked to me about wanting to be a manager, I said, understand the difference. When you're in your job, you succeed through your efforts. When you become a manager, you have to be comfortable with succeeding through the efforts of others. And if you're not comfortable with that, then find a way to direct your career in a direction that where you can continue to be the hands-on and, and succeed by your own, by your own deeds. Uh, and, and that, I think, helped a lot of, a lot of people that I worked with over the years. The other, the other thought I had that's been made life very difficult is uh, trying to lead these committees and help manage the civility is, is the lack of personal contact over the last year. I mean, we, we meet regularly on WebEx and it's mostly just video, you know, mostly it's just voice, very little video. Um, but we also always have these quarterly meetings where we all get together or most people get together. And, and when you're in a room with people, you, you can, A, you can get to know them better, but B, you can sort of read the room and figure out, you know, is, are things going well? And if somebody's got an issue that they're afraid to bring up, you can kind of see it on their face and you can help facilitate things so much better. And, and if, if somebody's kind of getting out of line or emotional, you can sort of see it and you can catch it before it gets too bad. I mean, working the room is just, I think, so important to managing a civil, civil dialogue. And you just lose so much of that, especially when people aren't even on video and they're just just voices in the ether. Uh, it's just been really, really difficult. So I'm very much looking forward to in the next few months, hopefully being able to to reassemble at the the wonderful facilities of RTCA and 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 to try to put these teams back in the same room together and help you know go out to lunch together, or go out for for an adult beverage after after the day is over, and 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 just be more of a a team than a scattering of individuals on the on the internet. Well, I think that's a great message to to end on, Jim. I think uh, you know the the it's been easy to be civil in a in a virtual environment, but we're um, um, it is going to be great to get back together live with people because that's when you really get some great things done and you have those personal interactions that are so very important. Um, in, in the work that we do and, and just, just in the human condition of being able to do that. So Shelby, thank you so very much. Uh, what, a, what a great uh, webinar and great, great messaging, uh, appreciate it. And, and to our panelists, Steve, Jim, Chuck, and Rebecca, uh, thank you for being very uh, interactive with everything. Great discussion and very informative and, and again, inspirational. So thank you all. Thank you thank all. You. Have a great day. Again, I want to um, take a moment to thank all of our sponsors for today's event. Uh, even during these difficult times, the, these organizations have been gracious enough to, uh, to make today's webinar happen. So again, my thanks to Collins Aerospace and to uh, AOPA as sponsors for today's webinar. Your continued support to the industry and to RTCA is very much appreciated. Well, that concludes today's webinar. Uh, again, my sincere appreciation to Shelby Scarborough and to our panelists, Steve Cook from Northrop Grumman, Jim Williams of JHW Unmanned Solutions, Professor, Professor Chuck LaBerge from the University of Maryland, and of course, Rebecca Morrison from RTCA. Thank you all for your valuable participation this afternoon.
And for the audience, thank you for joining us today. I hope uh, you found today's presentations educational, certainly inspiring and evolving. And again, these webinars are being recorded. So if you want to review anything presented today or review any of our past webinars, you can do so by going to the RTCA YouTube channel. I hope you all be able to join us for our next webinar, which is gonna be held uh, on Wednesday, April 21st, again at one o'clock p.m. Eastern time. And our topic for next month is aviation cybersecurity, harmonization on guidance and certification. We're gonna have a panel of some guests that are gonna include uh, GE Aviation, uh, Boeing, and a few others as we discuss the landscape of current guidance and certification work that's being done through the cybersecurity community. Uh, we're gonna discuss how those aviation standards are being harmonized among organizations, both here in the United States and abroad. And what are these important documents that are being developed? What are they trying to accomplish? An inside look at any upcoming document updates is gonna be shared during this session. So to prepare, for, prepare, prepare you all for what's ahead. It's gonna be a great interactive Q&A session with the panelists. In addition, we're gonna be joined by Ms. Victoria Newhouse, the uh, Deputy Assistant Administrator for Policy, Plans, and Engagement at the Transportation Security Agency. Victoria represents the TSA as the executive sponsor of the Aviation Security Advisory Committee and has executive responsibility for developing and implementing risk-reducing security regulations and requirements to protect transportation and the transportation infrastructure, both domestically and internationally. So I know you're gonna enjoy next month's webinar. So again, thank you all for being with us today and have a great day.